Well, good evening to everyone. Hope that your afternoon has gone well. I'm glad that we can be together again tonight. Have this opportunity to worship our God in spirit and in truth and an opportunity now to study together from God's Word. I'd encourage you to open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 20. If you're not already there, I want to share with us tonight a lesson that I've entitled that our eyes may be opened. You know, when you get to Matthew chapter 20, you are getting toward the, the last few days of Jesus upon the earth before his crucifixion. In the very next chapter, you're going to read about his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, that final week leading up to the crucifixion. When you start reading in chapter 20, you find Jesus giving us a parable. It's the parable of the workers in the, in the vineyard where a man agrees to pay the workers so much if they will work for him throughout the day. Later he finds some about the, the third hour of the day and tells them to go and work and he will pay them what they are due. He does the same with those that he finds about the sixth hour and, and then again at the ninth hour and even at the eleventh hour. And of course, when he is finished, or the day is finished, he pays them all the same reward. He teaches a great lesson about being able to come to him, even at the 11th hour, and receive the great reward that God has prepared for those who will obey his will. Following that, Jesus, for a third time, is going to tell his apostles we're going up to Jerusalem, and when I get there, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of the, the chief elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and they are going to condemn me, and they're going to turn me over to the Romans who will, who will beat me and who will crucify me. But I will rise again the third day. After that, the mother of James and John come to Jesus and she asks him if he will allow her sons James and John to sit one on the right hand and, and the other on the left in his kingdom they still don't understand the nature of the kingdom that Jesus is is going to establish and so Jesus explains that that is not his to give and that his kingdom is different. And the way to greatness in his kingdom is by being a servant. In fact, he's going to tell them that the Son of Man did not come to, to be served or to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And then the chapter closes beginning at verse 39 and going on through the end of the chapter with this event that's recorded where Jesus is going to encounter two blind men. Mark's account tells us that one of them, his name was Bartimaeus. And Jesus is going to heal these individuals. I want us to think about this event tonight for just a few moments. I know tonight we have our family Bible study, and, and Peter said to me before services, Tim, you're going to preach a short time tonight, right? I said, shorter, okay? I, I don't know what he had in mind with short, but shorter, because I know that we're going to be working on those verses. But I wanted to share these thoughts with us, some things about this event that's recorded. And I want us to think about their request, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Let's look beginning at verse 29. Matthew 20 verse 29 beginning. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. I can imagine in my mind events like this happening all the time to Jesus. You know, there are so many events that are recorded for us in the life of Jesus that just happen as he is passing by. He had been in the city 
no doubt teaching, no doubt performing miracles. And now as they're coming out of Jericho, here are these men, blind men, who are there begging. That's really all that society said that they could do. They were dependent upon the charity of others. And so they are begging for people to help them, to to give unto them so they can be sustained another day. And they hear that Jesus is coming by. They've heard the talk. Maybe they have heard him speak. And so they cry out for mercy unto Jesus. Verse 31 tells us, And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. The crowds wanted them to be quiet. The crowds in their minds were saying, he doesn't have time for you. You're not important enough. You don't matter. You know, that's the message that the devil wants us to hear. He wants us to believe God doesn't really care about you. Jesus doesn't have time for you. You you are insignificant. You, You don't matter. Look at all the people in the world. You're not one of those important people. You don't count. The world has a way of telling us that from time to time. And yet Jesus always took time for others. You never read of anyone being turned away from Jesus. He knew that These men, these beggars, these blind men, they mattered as much as any king could matter. And so the Bible says in verse 32, And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. You know, you read these things so often in the life of Jesus. Here he, he, he restores the ability to walk to a lame man. Here is one who is demon-possessed, and he cast out that unclean spirit. Here here is one that has palsy and he's able to tell him to take up his bed and walk. Here's one that is a leper and he touches them and they are cleansed. Here's one who has a servant who is ill that's 16 miles away. But Jesus speaks the word and that servant is restored to full health. It just happens so often as you read through the scriptures that here, by the time we get to Matthew chapter 20, it's commonplace. And yet, folks, remember, this is, this is miraculous. Jesus gave sight to these blind men, once again showing that he is who he said that he was, the Son of God. Well, when you think about this event, there's some ideas for us to, to take home, some things for us to, to ponder and think about, things we can learn from these blind men and what happens here. I want to share three thoughts very quickly tonight. Number one, they knew they needed Jesus. They knew that. When they hear that he's coming by, there in verse 30, they cry out to him, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. No doctor could help them, but Jesus could. They had heard of his ability to perform miracles. And so their cry is unto him. They knew they needed Jesus. Folks, we would show ourselves to be so very, very wise if we understood this great truth, our need for Jesus. You know, we're kind of conditioned throughout life to get to the point where we think of ourselves as self-sufficient. The worst book my wife and I ever gave to our children or read to their children was a little Sesame Street book entitled, I Can Do It Myself. Because that's what they thought from then on. When it came to their clothes and their shoes, I can do it four times faster than you can. But I can do it myself. 
Grover can do it himself. I can do it myself. And you know, that, that's a good thing. We have to learn to take care of ourselves. I understand that. But we kind of go through life that way, thinking, I don't need anyone else. I can do it all on my own. But folks, we need to realize our great need. Our great need for Jesus. Our great need for the Savior. It's a tragedy when people fail to recognize that. You know, in Matthew chapter 9, you read about Jesus going to the home of of that tax collector, Matthew. And he eats there with those that are other tax collectors and people in the community that were known as sinners and the scribes and the Pharisees. They, they, they don't like this at all. Well, if he's really the son of God, he wouldn't rub shoulders with those kinds of folks. And, and so they're wondering, why is he doing this? Why is he eating with them? And here's Jesus' response in Matthew 9, beginning at verse 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see... It was those tax collectors, those people that were counted as sinners who recognized their need. They were the ones they, that knew they needed the great physician. They needed Jesus. The Pharisees, the scribes, we don't need anyone. We're righteous already, all on our own. They weren't. That's what they thought. I don't need anyone. I don't need a savior. That's a tragic mistake when people don't recognize they need Jesus. John chapter 12 and verse 20 and 21, you read these things. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at, at the feast. This is after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and some have wanted to see Jesus. Some wanted to see Lazarus because he's the one who had come back to life after four days. But these Greeks, they come. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sirs, we would see Jesus. That was their great desire, because they knew their need for him. These blind men, they knew they needed Jesus. How wise we would show ourselves to be if we would recognize that same need. Now here's the second thing I want us to think about, and that is they would not give up. They wouldn't give up. The crowd, after they cried out, hush them, be quiet. They rebuked them. They were telling them, Jesus doesn't have time for you. You need to stop. He's on his way somewhere else. He's not going, you, you're slowing him down. You don't need to be crying out unto him. But did they stop? No. The Bible says in verse 31, but they cried the more. They weren't going to be silenced. They weren't going to give up. And what a great lesson that is for you and for me. As we think about living for Christ, seeking after Him, doing His will. We are never going to give up. Over in Matthew chapter 7, and verse 7 and 8, Jesus is going to tell His disciples, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh Findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. My friends, the idea there isn't the idea of just asking once, seeking once, knocking once. It's continuing in those things. You keep asking, you keep seeking, you keep knocking. 
You don't give up. We'll never give up in our service to Christ. Don't you know, friend, that Satan is always going to try to be tempting us to give up? And don't you know that's the easiest thing in the world to do? I mean, it's easy to do nothing. Right? I, I, I mean, that, you know... I, I was listening to a lady comedian the other day, and she said she had joined Weight Watchers nine times and lost seven pounds. She said, I'm glad there's not a limit on how many times you can start. Well, aren't you glad God doesn't limit us that way? Well, never going to give up. We're going to continue serving Him. Continue following after Him. And yes, there are going to be some, some pitfalls along the way. There might be some troubles and difficulties that I encounter. The devil's going to do all that he can to try and keep us from serving Christ, to get us to give up. But we just can't. We've got to keep pressing on if we want that prize. In Matthew chapter 13 and verses 45 and 46... I think you see the kind of attitude that we need to, to maintain as we are seeking the will of God. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Been searching. And when he found it, he gave up everything for that one. That this is the idea of someone searching for the kingdom, searching for truth, and when they find it, leaving everything else behind and following after Christ. These blind men showed themselves to be pretty wise, didn't they? They, they knew they needed Jesus, and they would not give up. That needs to be us. We know that we need the Savior. And we are not going to give up. Here's the third thing, the last thing I'll mention, and that is their request. Lord, open, open our eyes. There in verse 33, they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. I hope that's our prayer as well. That our eyes might be open. I, I'm not talking about physically. Some of us that are here may be struggling with issues with our, our vision, and it is a great blessing. And when we lose that or part of it, it it's a great difficulty upon us. And I, I don't know what the future holds for e even me to, to know if I'll have my eyesight throughout all my life. I, I, I don't know. But I know that my spiritual eyes need to always be open. And there are things that my eyes need to be open to. Your eyes need to be open to. And it ought to be our prayer that the Lord would open our eyes to these things. Let me share three with you just real quickly. How about praying that our eyes will be open to our blessings? That we'll never forget where our blessings come from. And that we'll think about the way that God has showered his blessings upon us. 23rd Psalm begins, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, there is nothing that I am in need of because my shepherd provides everything. He meets my every need. You go home tonight and you start listing, just in your mind, or you might write them out, but you can list all the things that we have that God has blessed us with. How blessed we are physically. And you compare that to, to so many in our world that go without not only the wants, but the needs that we have. And here they are at our fingertips. You ever do what I do? You go to the refrigerator and you look at one that's full and you shut the door and you say... There's nothing to eat. You ever do that? I, that's crazy, isn't it? It's all kinds of... It might not be exactly what I wanted at that moment. But we're so blessed. 
I hope we never forget where those blessings come from. But even more than that, I hope we'll think about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. You know, on a Lord's Day, I I hope our minds go that way. But not just on the Lord's Day. Every day, we are mindful of the way that our Lord has blessed us. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, we're told, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He has blessed us so much. And most of all, by giving us the greatest gift of all, his son. Remember? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. My friends, let's never forget and let's open our eyes to our blessings. But how about this? Let's open our eyes to our opportunities. I've been in the congregation here at Alki Road now for a couple of years. And one of the things I know about this congregation is there are opportunities in abundance to serve. Let's open our eyes to those opportunities and be involved in those opportunities. We have a wonderful Bible class program. We need teachers and assistant teachers all the time. Let's prepare ourselves to to be involved in that good work, support that good effort. We have young people that need to be encouraged and we have older folks that need to be thought of. Let's reach out. We have visitors to services that we can contact by call or by cards or by making a visit. Bible studies that we look forward to being able to conduct with others. Gospel meeting that is coming up that provides ample opportunity for us to to reach out. Friends that need to be influenced for good. We've got a community meal that's going to be starting here in the month of August. Folks, there is opportunity if we're looking for it and if we desire to serve. If we have the attitude, I will do whatever needs to be done. I'll be happy to serve in any way that I can. Those opportunities will abound. Let's keep our eyes open to them. You know, in Acts chapter 14... Verse 27, you read about what happens when Paul and Barnabas were returning from their first missionary journey. They went to the congregations that they had started on their way out, and then they came back, and they met with those brethren. And here's what we're told. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Folks, when you think about an open door, think about opportunity. That's what he's talking about. Opportunity abounded. Were there struggles along the way? Yeah. Yeah, there were. But that's going to be the way it is anytime there's opportunity. We just have to look for that good. Remember the fellow that went to the country as a shoe salesman and he wrote back to his boss and said, not going to have any... Success here, nobody wears shoes. Another fellow went, and his message back was, opportunity everywhere, no one has shoes. It's the way we look at it. Let's look for those opportunities, especially the opportunities to share the gospel with others. In Revelation 3 and verse 8, Jesus speaks to the church at Philadelphia And he says to them, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. An open door. Let's keep our eyes open for opportunity. And then, Lord, open our eyes to our future. I hope our mind's eye is always open on the future of the Christian. That's that heavenly home. And that makes whatever we have to go through in this life all worth it. 
Doesn't matter what it is or how long it may endure. It will be worth it all when we reach heaven's shore. And you know, we're getting closer every day. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 11, we're told, and that knowing the time, that it now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Paul wrote those words almost 2,000 years ago. But they've been true ever since. Because every day, every moment, our salvation is growing nearer. And I hope we keep our eyes open to the future. What a future God has planned for us if we will abide in Him. And so you look at this event in the life of Jesus where He is leaving the city and those blind men cry out and their desire is, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Folks, we can learn from them. They knew they needed Jesus. I hope we recognize that great need. They would not be denied. They would not give up. Let's make sure that's us. And let's pray like they did, that our eyes might be opened to our blessings, to our opportunities, and to our future. I hope that tonight our eyes are open to the will of God. And that if you are one who's not yet obeyed his will, you'll take advantage of the opportunity God's given you. And you'll come tonight and put on Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. We'd love to assist you. And if you're one who has obeyed but you've fallen away and need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. My friend, if you're subject in any way, come now as together we stand and as we sing.